Good morning. The Dear Hester Lectures were created to honor two souls who gave their lives to theological education. Uh, that passion continues and is extended today in this lecture. These lectures are dedicated to bringing the finest contemporary Christian scholars to the Gateway community. And this year, our lecturer is Dr. Kevin Van Hooser, Professor of Systematic Theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, though he thinks a more appropriate title might be Perpetual Pupil of Theology. A graduate of Westmont College and Westminster Seminary and Cambridge University, Dr. Van Hooser has taught at Edinburgh, Wheaton, and Trinity. His work is infused by the spirit, informed and normed by the canon, informed by the tradition, and rich with allusions, references, and reflections on the theological conversation that has preceded him. Thomas Hoving, the uh, former director of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, has defined a masterpiece as a work that captures an era. Dr. Van Hooser's theological corpus is masterful in that it is summative, instructive, and corrective of the very best thinking of this era, and is already an important and permanent part of the theological reflection of the church. He quotes Karl Barth approvingly when he says, the theologian who has no joy in his work is not a theologian at all. This morning we have a privilege of seeing how much joy Dr. Van Hooser takes and gives in his work. If theology is faith speaking understanding, it's appropriate that we should not only read Dr. Van Hooser, but hear him. His topic this morning is a place to make disciples, the doctrine of the church for future pastors of the church. Would you give a warm gateway welcome to Dr. Kevin Van Hooser. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in my native state of California. It's always easy to come back to California bring you greetings from Trinity, the saints, the sanctified saints, uh, in, especially in the winter in the Midwest. I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. For many 21st century Christians, that line from the Apostles' Creed, of all the lines we say, may be the most difficult to confess. We believe the Father raised Jesus from the dead, we believe the Trinity, insofar as we can understand it. But to believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that's hard because it's one of the few lines from the Apostles' Creed that refers to something that we can see. And there's the rub. We see the divisions. We feel the pains of people in church that have needs that have not been met. We witness the spectacle of congregations whose lives too often mirror the brokenness we see in society. Fractured relationships, political corruption, feuds, factions. It seems the church only makes headlines when there's a scandal to report. And sad to say, the church has been in the news quite a bit this year. In addition to the sex abuse cases in the Roman Catholic Church, the Chicago Tribune in my area has had a field day recently covering charges against the founders of two megachurch evangelical pastors, uh, Willow Creek and Harvest Bible Chapel. So no wonder people are losing confidence in the institutional church. Wretched layman that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death and disappointment? I believe in the church. Help mine unbelief. I believe the church is an ingredient and an implication of the gospel. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And here's my question. Is the church one of those things of first importance? 
And there's a right way and a wrong way to answer this. The wrong way is the way of the late medieval Roman Catholics who claimed the church was necessary for salvation. Extra ecclesium nulla salus, outside the church there is no salvation. There were some in the Roman Catholic Church at that time that said that grace, saving grace, was found in the church and the church only. It was locked up in the sacraments, and only the priests had the keys to the kingdom, that is, salvation. The church in that late Roman Catholic medieval setting was a mediator between God and humanity, and it was against that picture that Luther and the Reformers protested. That was the wrong answer to the question, is the church of first importance? The right answer is to unpack the gospel itself. The, creature, as a, the church is a creature of the word and an implication of the gospel. Listen to the first of the 10 theses of Bern from 1528. The Holy Christian Church, whose only head is Christ, is born of the word of God, abides in the same, and does not listen to the voice of a stranger. The church as a gathered community, a creature of the word, summoned by the gospel, that church is a central theme in scripture. In fact, the God of the gospel, without the gathered people of the gospel, is a contradiction in terms. The whole purpose of God is to form a people to be his own treasured possession, a holy nation and kingdom of priests. Conversely, there can be no true church without the presence and activity of God or without God's gospel. A gathering without the gospel is not a church, it's just a flash mob. Now, the fundamental question of philosophy is often posed, why is there something rather than nothing? Our question this morning is even more challenging. Why is there a church rather than something else? Before we can answer that teleological question, what the church is for, we need to say something about the ontology or nature of the church, what it is. And to do that is to begin to formulate a doctrine of the church. Doctrine simply means teaching. There are doctrines about all sorts of things. Metaphysics teaches about the nature of reality and that says what there is. Christian doctrine, similarly, is about reality and it sets forth in words what there is in relation to the triune God. It says what God is doing in Christ or even more briefly, Christian doctrine says what is in Christ. Christian doctrine then speaks about God, the gospel, and all things in relation to God and the gospel. And the church is one of those things. There is church rather than something else because it is one of the things God is doing in Christ. That's an important claim about what the church is. There's church rather than nothing or rather than something else because the church is one of the things God is doing in Christ. So to think theologically about the church is to look past the sociology to the ground and context of the church's life, which is the presence and activity of the triune God. Scripture reflects this. The church is the people of God, the body of Christ, the fellowship of the spirit. These are all biblical images, and they remind us that the church is fundamentally a theological rather than a sociological entity only. Paul Menier's classic work, Images of the Church in the New Testament, looks at 96 different descriptions of the church, and we don't have time to review them all. These various images are important, though, they, because they color our self-conception of who we think we are as church, and they affect the way we do church as members of it. Well, this is just my introduction. I've already made some pretty large claims. I've said the church is a creature of God's word, an implication of the gospel, and I've suggested that the doctrine of the church will affect how we see ourselves as its members and what we do as church. I focus on this because too often a misleading picture of the church and the pastor holds us captive. For example, we may have an idea of the pastor as manager 
or therapist or entertainer or yes, even superhero. <laughs> what about teacher? Many of my seminary students tell me they want to be pastor teachers. They see themselves like David slaying not simply thousands, but tens of thousands in a good way through their scholarship and their scholarly preaching, making a difference for Christ. But I've learned over the years myself, through many years of teaching, that it's not enough to be a transmitter of right information. And knowledge alone neither saves or sanctifies us. So here, too, a picture has captured many congregational imaginations, a picture of doctrine as something merely bookish, abstract, and impractical. My aim is to retrieve the disciple-making dynamics of doctrine. And I want to do so by challenging some of the common pictures we have of doctrine and suggesting something else to put in their place as to what doctrine is. So, um, the way forward. I've already said that not every gathering constitutes a church. There are gatherings on Sunday mornings, like the Houston Oasis, that calls itself a community grounded in reason, celebrating the human experience. It, it, as I say, it meets at 10.30 Sunday mornings for fellowship and support. Their web page, if you go there, you'll see this. Their web page proudly states, there is no doctrine to follow. Yet, the community has something like a confession of faith, even if it begins not with credo, we believe, but with cogito, I think. That such communities exist means that the church has to think more carefully about its distinct nature, identity, and mission. So I've said the church is an implication of the gospel. The church doesn't simply proclaim the gospel. In a sense, it is the gospel. Think of the church as a public service announcement <laughs> that God's kingdom is coming, that a new creation has dawned. The church is concrete communal evidence that the new humanity of Christ has begun. Ethnic divisions like Jew-Greek are no more in the church. Neither are class divisions like master-slave. So I think the church is a place to make disciples because it's the primary location for transforming minds and hearts and practices by conforming them to what God is doing in Christ. The church, says Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is God's new will and purpose for humanity. So I hope you're beginning to see why there is church rather than something else. The church is a place to make disciples. But pastors have to understand what kind of place the church is if they're to respond rightly to their vocation as ministers of the gospel. To that end, I want first to speak to the importance of having the right metaphors to minister by. Then I'll sketch two models for thinking about pastor theologians and about the church that specify what kind of place it is. The first one I've spoken on at length before, but I continue to find it compelling, the idea of the pastor as leader of a theatrical company, commissioned not simply to proclaim, but to perform the gospel as a community. And the second model is one I've explored more recently, the pastor as fitness trainer of the body of Christ. I think that's particularly suited for California. <laughs> but we begin with some thoughts on the importance of ministerial self-conception. Metaphors matter. They structure our way of thinking about things and our own self-conceptions. George Lakoff and Mark Johnson wrote an influential book in 1980 entitled Metaphors We Live By. And it's no stretch to suggest that there are also metaphors we minister by. William Willimon observes, contemporary ministry has been the victim of images of leadership that are borrowed not from scripture, but from the surrounding culture. The pastor is CEO, a psychotherapeutic guru, or as political agitator. Those are metaphors that control what you do as a pastor if they're the ones that are in place. 
Eugene Peterson is especially critical of the managerial metaphor. He says, the vocation of the pastor has been replaced by the strategies of religious entrepreneurs with business plans. American pastors, without really noticing what was happening, got their vocations redefined in terms of American careerism. We quit thinking of the parish as a location for pastoral spirituality and started thinking of it as an opportunity for advancement. I think these misleading pictures of what pastoral ministry involves have actually contributed to the secularization of the church. So we have to address the problem at the source. The problem, if there is a problem with the church, is not with the official statements of faith, but with the hidden curriculum, these metaphors and pictures we live by and minister by. So what is the first picture that comes to your mind when you think of a pastor? I'm guessing it's not an action hero or someone with a superpower. Now, Jesus uses the image of his shepherd. It's not quite as exciting for young boys as firemen or policemen, but if you read about the stories of David who fought off lions and bears as a shepherd, then that changes a little bit. The author of Hebrews pictures Jesus as the great shepherd. But I wonder what was Jesus' own self-conception of his ministry? We get a hint in Luke 2, 49. This is the episode when his, he went away from his parents and his parents were desperately looking for him. And Jesus, when they found him, says, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Or more literally, don't you know I must be about in the things of, in choice of my father, in the things of my father? I think that may be as good a description of the vocation of the pastor theologian as any I've heard someone whose priority is being involved in the things of the Father. But just as Jesus' parents were confused about what Jesus was up to, so many people today are confused about pastors and what they do. We won't understand either Jesus or pastors until we understand something of the things of the Father, the Father's business. Well, contra popular opinion, God the Father is not in the business of forgiveness. He's in the business of formation. From the beginning of Scripture, we see that his purpose in creating and calling Israel was to form a people to be his own treasured possession. This was his purpose for Israel, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But it's also a description that recurs in connection to the church in 1 Peter 2.9 where we read, you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. This is why there is church. This is the purpose for which the Son and the Spirit have been sent into our world to sum up all things in Christ, to form this body in Christ. Now, Jesus came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God in words, parables, and deeds, miracles. Establishing the kingdom is the Father's business and the Son's mission. But it's also our great commission. Jesus tells his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The kingdom is simply God's reign through God's people in God's place. The church exists to bring people into God's kingdom that is, under the lordship of Christ, and to be an embassy of that kingdom in every place where two or three are gathered in Christ's name. So this is a great privilege and responsibility for pastors. They get to be like the Old Testament priests, those who serve in God's house, a house not made of brick and mortar, but a house made of people. 1 Peter 2.5 says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. And in light of that verse, I think the boy Jesus' words take on new urgency. Don't you know that I must be in my Father's house? That's the way some passages translate Luke 2.49. 
in my father's house, in my father's things, in my father's business. The point is pastors are involved in God's building project. Now, pastors aren't professor theologians who work primarily with words and books to formulate doctrine. Pastors are public theologians who work with people to create a place where God reigns. This is striking, you see. People are the pastor's medium for doing theology. And this isn't only for senior pastors. This is for, I think, all pastors, youth pastors, family pastors. We're all working with people. So the church is an eminently theological project. It's a place where people grow in understanding and then demonstrate their understanding in the way they live, in what they say and what they do in forms of everyday life. Metaphors matter. And one of the chief ways that pastors make disciples is to take every thought and imagination captive to obey Christ. I've already said it's not enough to tell people what they're supposed to believe or what they're to do. That lecture style doesn't work. To make disciples, we have to win hearts and transform imaginations. And I think ultimately it's a matter of helping people to see and taste the goodness of what the Father is doing in the Son through the Spirit, appreciating the gospel story to the point where all other stories seem dull in comparison. Stories, you see, are often the form that worldviews take, and they function like operating systems on a computer, but they're located in our imaginations. We're all following some programming, some story, some script. Uh, stories that program, sorry, stories that program the way we think about things. Where did it go? Shoulder. So to become a disciple is to practice sola scriptura, scripture alone, in the realm of the imagination. The gospel has to become the control story that programs our lives. Now, in working with people to do theology, pastors obviously help them to read scripture, but they also help them to read the signs of the times. I believe culture is a powerful means of spiritual formation. It's the informal curriculum that often is at war with the official curriculum of the church. I'm not saying that everything in culture is evil, not by a long shot, but I am saying that pastors have to help congregations to learn how to read popular culture and understand what kind of spirituality it's trying to cultivate. Is it consumerism? Is it narcissism? The philosopher Charles Taylor says that behind our secular age is a social imaginary that funds it not with philosophies or official arguments and policy statements, but funds it with metaphors and stories. He says a social imaginary is simply the way people imagine their social existence. Now, I don't think I'm being alarmist when I say that a sub-evangelical, secular, social imaginary often holds sway even in our churches. The urgent challenge of our time, I think, is to make sure that the church isn't socially embodying some other gospel, some other social imaginary than the one that centers on Jesus Christ, for there is no other gospel. But for example, there's the health and wealth gospel, and people, if that picture of what the gospel is rules your minds, that gives rise to a very different kind of Christian life. So it's the role of the pastor theologian to help shape the church's collective imagination around the story of what the Father is doing in the Son through the Spirit to make all things new. And if we're living out any other story than that, we're turning to a different gospel, which is to say away from the truth. I believe in the church, and I believe the need of the present hour is a renewed vision for making disciples who can embody individually and corporately the truth, goodness, and beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the time that remains, I want to explore two ways of remodeling, as it were, the church 
to ways of thinking about the church with new metaphors that hopefully will fuel ministry and fire up your imagination. The first one is theatrical, and it focuses on the corporate dimension of discipleship. The church, on this view, is a company of actors that participate in what we could call God's drama of redemption. There are several advantages to this way of thinking about church as a place to make disciples. Most importantly, it highlights theology's responsibility to focus on the founding story that undergirds the church. Now, in order to avoid misunderstanding, let me begin by saying what the church as theater is not. It's not a stage on which pastors strut their stuff. It's not an auditorium where the congregation is simply passive observers. That doing church is not something pastors do. Churching alone is a contradiction in terms. Thirdly, it's not an excuse for church members to play act their faith. This is a danger, a mortal danger, for which the New Testament has a special term, hypocrisy. That is a real danger. But making disciples is not a matter of pretending to be something you're not. It's a matter of becoming the part to which you have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing hypocritical about becoming who we really are in Christ, and that's what it is to disciple someone. But let me now say what the church as theater is. The, the term theater refers both to a place where stories get acted out, and it can also refer to the company that does the acting. The church, similarly, is a place where people gather to do theater, to be a theater of the gospel. It's a place where the life and death and resurrection of Christ is acted out. And it starts, of course, with the disciples' baptism, a repeat, as it were, of Jesus' scene of death and resurrection. The drama of discipleship is the story of Jesus made flesh in us. So the church is the theater of the gospel, but the world is the stage on which God himself has first acted out and made himself known and communicated his light and life. And this it means that the gospel is theodrama, theo, theos, drao, acting out. The gospel is God acting out. And this is the story of which we're a part, the story of what God has done, is doing, and will do in Jesus Christ. This is the story that has to be lodged in the primary place of our hearts and minds and imaginations. Now, theater speaks the language of action. And the Bible recounts the mighty acts of God from creation to consummation. You see, when we have theater as our ruling metaphor, the emphasis is not on a set of propositional truths. A lot of people associate systematic theology with that picture. But theater focuses on a series of events, of happenings. And the medium of theater is not disembodied thinking, but bodily action and interaction. I find encouragement that Calvin calls the world the theater of God's glory. It's a lovely description for what God has done on the stage of world history. So think of the history of salvation as a five-act play. Each act is set in motion by a speech act of God. Let there be kicks off creation. The promise, I will make of you a great nation, establishes the covenant of grace, act two. The word was made flesh, that's act three, the incarnation. And then Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, and that initiates act four, the act of the church that begins with Pentecost. And then finally, I am the Alpha and Omega, which opens the fifth and final act, where all things will indeed be summed up in Christ. To point, my point here is that to understand our faith and ourselves as Christians, we need to understand where in the story we are. 
We were in Act 4, the closing scenes. Interestingly, the same act and scene as the apostles themselves. On this model, I suggest doctrine is a kind of theatrical direction. Now, one of the acts of the risen Christ was to appoint pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I think pastor theologians minister what I call theodramatic understanding, understanding of this five-act drama and our place in it. The special role of the pastor theologian is to help people understand that drama, but then also have disciples understand their own roles and how do you grow into the part that you've been given to play? How do you understand the Holy Script as the script of your life? And how do you play it to the glory of God? All of these questions are how the pastor theologian helps make disciples. So on this view, doctrine is theatrical direction. It, it helps disciples understand the play of which they are a part, and it provides direction for how disciples participate rightly in the ongoing action. The goal of theology, then, is far from abstract. It's very practical. The goal of theology is to help understand, to help disciples understand what's going on and their part in it. I know the cultural scenery has changed from the New Testament, but we're still involved in the same drama. So theology is faith seeking, speaking, and then showing understanding. James 2.18 says, I will show you my faith by my works. That's an example of theodramatic understanding. So scripture is the story we live by, our holy script. But doctrines are summaries and explorations of that story. And if we understand the story, we'll be better able to follow it today. So doctrine makes disciples by yielding practical wisdom, the knowledge of what to say and do as a follower of Jesus Christ in this situation or in that situation. If you really understand the drama, you'll know what to do in a new scene. Another way of putting this would be to say that doctrine serves the project of forming disciples, people who have and can display the mind of Christ. So doctrine provides direction for disciples to embody the way, truth, and life of Jesus faithfully, that is according to the script, and fittingly in ways that uh, correspond to the situation you're in. Fittingness is a key term. Doctrine helps us understand what kind of speech and action is fitting for disciples given the story of Jesus Christ. To be or not to be in Christ, that is the only question for the actor disciple. So on this view, pastor theologians are, are like theatrical directors, midwives of the script's performance. The first commandment of a good theatrical director is faithfulness to the script, and that goes for the church as well. The, the Holy Spirit, of course, is the primary director. The Holy Spirit is the one who guides the church into all truth, yet pastor theologians are assistant directors. This is the role that they play in the drama. Christ has given the church these offices for this specific purpose, for overseeing local productions of the gospel. So let me make four final points about the role of the pastor theologian according to this theatrical model. First of all, on this model, the church is not an optional thing. The church is a command performance. It's Jesus' royal theater. It's a theater of kingdom operations. We know that Jesus came teaching about the kingdom in parables, but the church that obeys his words will be a living parable of the kingdom. And I think that's a lovely image to have in your mind as you, as you lead your churches. Can you create with people parables of the kingdom of God, embodied manifestation of God's will on earth as it is in heaven? Second, Leslie Newbegin says that congregations are 
the only hermeneutic of the gospel. The way Christians live together, the way Christians do church, is doctrine's primary exhibit. It's our most important commentary on the meaning of the Bible. Paul explains that the aim of his apostolic ministry is to make all men see the plan of salvation, the mystery of Christ, so that through the church, in this place, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, Ephesians 3.10. Churches are indeed placed gatherings, local theaters of the gospel. And again, this is the challenge of discipleship and the challenge of doing church, how to act out the reality that is in Christ in our place and time. It takes a community fully to do this. It takes at least two to act out forgiveness, and it takes more than two to act out the reconciliation that should characterize the church as a multi-ethnic community. And of course, one of the best ways to perform gospel truth and to form disciples is to keep the feast. Do this in remembrance of me, says Jesus. It's easy to lose sight of how radical a scene it must have been in New Testament times. People from different ethnicities and classes sharing a meal together. The Lord's Supper is a climactic scene in the drama of redemption. Jesus is acting out the results of his death for us. And the church gathers at the Lord's table not as spectators, but as actors. That is, active participants in the eating and drinking. The church isn't pretending that the bread is Christ's body, and nor is it simply going through the motions to reenact a past event. No, it's more complicated and wonderful than that. The church is celebrating something that in one sense is already past, Christ's death, but in another scene, another sense, is not fully realized, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and yet, in another sense, we're celebrating a present reality now, this new life and membership in the one body of Jesus Christ. Let me turn now to a second image of the church as a place to make disciples, the fitness center. And the focus here is going to be on individual disciples, not, not necessarily the community. Each of us is somebody's disciple. We're all following someone's words of wisdom, either that of a parent or Plato or a footnote to Plato, a poster from Whole Foods, a political platform. We're all following words that guide or script our lives. For many North Americans, we are disciples of someone's scheme for health or diet or wellness the pursuit for, of well-being defines our present cultural moment. Uh, the Protestant work ethic has been replaced by the neo-pagan workout ethic with its cult of the body. Maybe you've heard of the Global Wellness Institute, a nonprofit organization whose mission is, quote, to empower wellness worldwide by educating public and private sectors about preventative health and wellness. What's wellness? Well, the GWI defines wellness as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Wellness. As to health and beauty, uh, contemporary culture pretty much sets those standards particularly as concerns ideal body images, males or females alike. So on the one hand, our culture seems almost obsessed with the body and health and wellness and physical fitness. But on the other hand, there's a relative lack of concern, I think, for the spiritual fitness of the body of Christ and its individual members. I think the contrast is startling. We spend billions of dollars and gobs of time on our physical body in pursuit of wellness, but the church is somewhat out of shape. 
And this despite the New Testament's repeated use of athletic imagery. Paul speaks of the Christian life as running a race. And the idea of training is particularly prominent, uh, appropriately enough, in the pastoral epistles. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, train yourselves for godliness. And the verb train, gymnase, is the word from which we get our English term gymnasium. A gymnasium for godliness. Think about that. And this brings me then to the second image of the church. The church as a gymnasium, a fitness center for the body of Christ. And the training in question prepares individual disciples to be fit members of the company of the gospel. I've explored this model of the pastor as fitness trainer in a book that's coming out in May, Hearers and Doers. Central to the book and to this second model of the church as, as a place to make disciples is the idea of uh, exercising our core. Core training is all the rage these days. The core, you see, is the inmost part of something. Uh, think of the core of an apple. Um, and our English word comes from the Latin core and the French coeur, terms that mean heart. So in the context of physical fitness, the core is the foundation for all bodily movement. The core is the key component of your body's support structure and the basis for bodily movement. And almost everything we do with our bodies depends on core muscles. It's been shown that modern lifestyles are largely sedentary, and that means that many of our core muscles risk becoming inactive and atrophied. Over time, a failure to exercise your core muscles will result in a loss of your ability to perform everyday activities bending, lifting, things like that. The body of Christ has a core. And that's what I think we need to focus on. It has to do with the disciples' heart, with the disciples' willingness and ability actually to follow Jesus with our bodies and our hearts and minds. So are there exercises to strengthen that core? You can't lose weight or simply become, or become fit simply by reading diet books or training manuals. I think this is significant. Reading alone doesn't help you lose weight. I wish reading was a way of burning calories, but it isn't. So similarly, you can't become a disciple of Jesus simply by reading about him. You actually have to start following. Well, fitness trainers focus on three areas core stability, core strength, and core mobility. And I think in the way I work these things out, these three correspond to three aspects of the disciple's inner being, mind, will, and heart. I'm linking heart with mobility because ultimately it's not our thoughts but our desires that motivate us to do things. So in the book, I suggest some core exercises that pastors can use with church members. And here I can have time just to give a, a brief sketch. But the core stability of the body of Christ has to do with keeping balance, not falling into temptation. And one way to achieve balance is to know who you are and what you believe. Paul cautions against holding or practicing false doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ or the teaching that accords with godliness. You see, it's the person who understands orthodoxy who is least likely to be tossed about to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4.14. We need doctrinal stability if we're not going to be one of these people blown about. And speaking of core stability, Paul calls the church the pillar and foundation of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. So, simply belonging to a truth that is, uh, sorry, simply belonging to a church that is teaching the truth, simply belonging can be a stabilizing factor. At the same time, 
James says even the demons believe. So, as I've said, simply filling heads with right doctrine isn't the only core exercise. We also need to training in core strength. We need the ability to perform challenging tasks and to keep doing them. We need strength and endurance to push back against all those cultural forces, powers, and principalities that are preventing us from following Jesus. And the disciples' strength is, involves more than physical muscles. It involves even more than willpower. If we thought that being a disciple was simply a matter of willpower, then we're heading towards Pelagianism and the gospel of self-help. No, the source of the disciples' core strength is the life of Christ in us, the life of Christ that faith takes hold of in response to God's promises. Paul prays that our inner being would be strengthened with power through the Spirit of God. And Paul himself claims that he can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens him, Philippians 4.13. And he exhorts Timothy to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Talk about core strength. It's the strength of Christ. But to be a follower of Jesus, you have to get moving, and you have to keep moving, and then you have to be sufficiently motivated. So, in addition to uh, stability and strength, we also need to work on core mobility. What gets me out of bed in the morning is not simply duty, but desire. A desire to play whatever scenes God has for me this day. Now, it's not insignificant that the first Christians were called the way rather than the idea. <laughs> we need core stability and core strength in order to have core mobility, in order to walk the way. And walking after Jesus is the characteristic activity of the disciple. Paul tells the Ephesians that they are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. Now, the U.S. Department of Health recommends that we each take at least 10,000 steps a day in order to achieve physical fitness. But a disciple's walk consists of thousands of choices we make each day, choices that result either to follow Jesus or to go our own way. As C.S. Lewis puts it in Mere Christianity, every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. We want to make that core the kind of thing that makes the right choice to follow Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that our culture has a very hard time defining fitness. Is it a matter of achieving some standard of health or beauty? What is that standard and who says so? Well, going back to the ancient Greeks, the first gymnasium uh, was preparing people for the Olympic Games. But the Olympic Games weren't simply games. They weren't simply sporting events. They were part of military training. And in fact, even in today's Olympic events, many of them, like wrestling and the javelin throw and even foot races, remind us that the original games were all about preparing Greek men for war. Now, fast forward a couple of millennia to 2009 when the United States Armed Forces rolled out something called total force fitness. The armed forces defined fitness as, quote, a balance between readiness and well-being. A force that has achieved total fitness, they say, is healthy, ready, and resilient, capable of meeting challenges and surviving threats. According to the military, then, fitness is the ability to accomplish your mission without injuring yourself. I think this reminds us or explains why defining fitness is so hard. Being fit is like being useful. 
Nothing is useful in general. You have to specify a purpose. And everything depends then, when we think about spiritual fitness, on the purpose for which we declare a disciple fit. Now, I've already mentioned it. It goes back to 1 Timothy 4, 7. Train yourself for godliness. That's the purpose for achieving spiritual fitness. And the church should be helping people, training people to become godly, to become Christ-like. Now, I need to say here that in a strict sense, only God makes disciples. That is, only God regenerates our natures and makes us new creatures. But as I've been stressing, God has given us the church as a nurturing environment and ministers as gifts in that nurturing environment. Calvin speaks of the church as a mother in order to highlight the nurturing aspect of the church. So the role of the pastor is to provide nurture for disciples to become in actuality what they already are in Christ eschatologically. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. But the, my focus here is fitness for purpose. Pastor theologians make disciples who are fit for purpose, but the purpose isn't military, right? We know this because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He told Peter to put away his sword. That's not the way we follow Jesus into the kingdom. On the contrary, disciples are fit for purpose when they're able to act as heralds and representatives of God's kingdom. They're fit for purpose not when they can fight to establish the kingdom, but rather when they witness with every fiber of their being to the fact that the kingdom is already here. Now, discipleship is the call, a vocation, to follow Jesus everywhere, before everyone, at all times. And disciples are fit for purpose when they can do that, when they can function as ambassadors of the kingdom and citizens of the gospel. And again, this is closely connected to the original purpose of the Greek gymnasium, which was, yes, about training soldiers, but it was also about making citizens fit for the purpose of preserving the polis, the city. City citizenship was also the purpose of the gymnasium. And pastor theologians trained disciples to be citizens, <clears throat> good citizens, not of the state, but of the city of God. And that means the kind of people who can promote the values and embody the values of their holy nation. Now, I've said that Paul was a fitness trainer. Maybe the best specimen to come out of the apostolic gymnasium was a citizen named Philemon. Philemon is the epitome of Christ-centered core stability, core strength, and core mobility. At least that's what I want to suggest to you. Remember, Paul asked Philemon to act out his discipleship in a way that was as shocking to the Romans as it was fitting to his situation. Paul asked Philemon to receive Onesimus, an escaped slave, back into his household, not as a fugitive to be uh, punished, which was his right under Roman law, but rather as a brother in Christ to be welcomed. Now, make no mistake, this is high drama. What's Philemon going to do? Paul's addressing a pastoral situation that may have been unprecedented. So how was he going to bring doctrine to bear in directing Philemon's discipleship? And the drama is, was Philemon going to follow the Roman script or the gospel script? I think it's interesting that Paul takes pains not to command Philemon's obedience. He has the right to do so as his father in Christ, but he doesn't exercise it. Instead, Paul expresses the hope that Philemon's good deed would be voluntary and not something forced. And this is important, you see, because a, a disciple does something out of the right reflex, 
out of readiness, out of the desire to do what is fitting given the drama of the Christ. Readiness and ability to do the right thing is the key. You might say Paul is asking Philemon to improvise his discipleship, to do what is fitting, even if it means going against the prevailing Roman script. And Paul in his epistle is confident that Philemon will freely do it, even more than Paul asks, because Paul is convinced that Philemon understands the story of which he is part, and he's convinced that Philemon has been trained it to be the kind of person to express discipleship freely. He has trained Philemon well in godliness and Christ-likeness and gospel citizenship. But it all starts with core stability, recalling the nature of the drama of the Christ in which we are a part. It's a drama about God's grace. It's about his unmerited goodness to us. It's about his invitation to share in his own divine life, to fellowship with the Father in the Son through the Spirit. It's about hospitality to strangers. It's another way of saying what God has done to us and showing us mercy. And so hospitality to earthly strangers is an acting out of the gospel insofar as it expresses the, God, the love of God that he has shown to us. And early Christian writers claimed that transcending social and ethnic differences by sharing meals, by sharing homes, by worshiping with others, with people from different backgrounds, that was a proof of the truth of the Christian faith. They did it. They did the argument. That was the drama of, of the gospel truth. And I think this is still striking for us today. Maybe there's no more startling example of the radical implications of the communion of the saints than what Paul asks Philemon to do. He says, welcome him, Onesimus, as you would welcome me. Welcoming those who are in Christ is a dramatic expression of our own welcome into the household of God. Are we sufficiently fit for this purpose? Have we been trained to react with the same reflexes? Are we ready to play our part when the scene is ours? Can we improvise our discipleship in our places and contexts? This is the challenge of discipleship, and pastor theologians are here for this task, to help train people to become disciples, fit for holy purpose. So embodied action, not just talk, but embodied action is the language of the theater. And as we now have seen, embodied action is the goal of bodily fitness. I think it's interesting now to correlate this with what the Bible says about worship. The Bible often correlates worship with physical postures like bending or lying prostrate. For disciples, all of life, is a place to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, Romans 12, 1. So theology and worship, doctrine and doxology, these work together to train us to make the right bodily movements, which is our spiritual worship. And a fit church is able to make the right bodily movements, Movements that express, as it were, the body language of faith. Gestures that express doctrines. Now, gestures don't express, simply express thought or language. The gestures is a part of language. And I think pastor theologians help congregations to learn the grammar of faith, to speak this language, but also to express it in words of truth and works of love in what we might call Christly gestures. Worship and theology alike teach disciples to perform embodied actions that show forth the mind of Christ in the body of Christ. So the church becomes, in its bodily life, a Christly gesture. 
Worshipful acts are the body language of the church. And like forms of exercise, the more you perform them, the stronger you become. It's only when we have the mind of Christ that the body of Christ will be able to make such Christly gestures, such as embracing a stranger or a runaway slave. But this is the story of which we're a part. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And the same may go for Christly gestures. The task of discipleship is to accord in word and deed, speech and gesture, with not simply a story, but with the reality that is in Christ. The gospel is no opiate of the masses. The gospel is a strong dose and a long drink of reality. And it's the privilege and responsibility of pastor theologians to build up the body of Christ one member at a time into this glorious reality. So to be a pastor theologian is ultimately a matter of helping men and women and children to learn to make Christly gestures, um, learn to live out the life of Christ that is in them individually and corporately. And when they do that, they get real because heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus' words and Jesus' story will not. I can't imagine anything else in the world we should be doing that's more urgent and exciting and important than that. So God bless you as you continue your studies and God speed your ministries as you make disciples and churches that will be Christly gestures. Thank you. What a rich theological feast we have been uh, directed to metaphors to minister through and out of. We've been reminded that people are the medium of ministry. We have uh, been told that culture is the inevitable and inextricable, sometimes harmful dialogue partner with which we, with, with which we must adjust ourselves. We have been told that the church is the gospel on display, where it's performed and lived and loved and shown. And then, then we've been invited to the gymnasium to burn off all these theological calories. And a, uh, a challenging evocation that we, our core might be strengthened and deepened and filled with Christ, that we might be able to be so habituated that our choices will regularly be uh, to follow him and show him. Thank you for that challenge, I think. It, it, it is overwhelming, which is maybe a pretty good place for uh, theological direction to take us. Um, thank you, Dr. Van Hoover, Van Hooser, and now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all this day and always. Go in his great love. <laughs>